we, we take our pro-life conviction and, we be, and, and our conviction that all life is sacred and we apply it to every aspect of life, not just to one aspect or one issue, but to every issue. So tonight we're going to talk about how, we talked about the Sermon on the Mount the last three weeks. Tonight we're going to talk about how the church, the early church in the New Testament, through the epistles and through Revelation, embodied that teaching. And, and kind of the, the, the wise remark I have is, can you believe a bunch of people actually took Jesus seriously and took him at his word? And what does that look like when people take Jesus at his word? Well, all you have to do is look at the church. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, they took Jesus' teachings and his ethic and his conviction in the sanctity of life and put it into practice. We're going to study that tonight. Next week, we're going to talk about just a very big kind of conversation about what we've learned and how we might apply it to today's kind of topics. We're going to talk about different things about, you know, what do we see in the world and, and, and when we say we're pro-life or we adhere to the sanctity of life, how can that inspire us to think in, in various social issues, not just, you know, abortion? Um, um, and, um, and, and, of course, that issue as well, but, but a, a multiplicity of issues, okay? So we'll talk about that next week. And then we'll move on to Kimmel talk the next week. That's the uh, 19th. And then after that, we'll start a new series, uh, which I'll, I'll come up with. The 18th. the 18th, sorry. Okay, so the New Testament from Acts, I'm reading in your lesson today. The New Testament from Acts to Revelation reveals that the early church, under the power of the Holy Spirit, took Jesus' Sermon on the Mount literally and seriously. They did not bend his word for their convenience or make it a metaphor for living. Well, Jesus was just speaking metaphorically. He didn't really mean that. They did not spiritualize the text. You know, um, you ever meet somebody who says, well, I believe, uh, I, I practice my faith privately. My faith is private. It's like, no, if you're following Jesus, you can't just bifurcate that and just do that privately. Following Jesus is a very public, a very public action that wraps into, that, 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 um, that enwraps all of our life, the public and the private. So they didn't just spiritualize the text and say, well, it's good for spirituality. But when I'm in the world and when I'm doing things my, you know, out in the world, I go by my own rules. No, they didn't spiritualize it. But applied it concretely for the service of the gospel. Now, if you read the New Testament word for word, okay, and read it carefully, you will learn that there is only one highest goal for the church, and that was to bear witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They didn't claim their rights. Do you remember when Paul was arrested? He did not say, give me a defense attorney. I'm innocent. No. He used it as an opportunity to share the gospel. Why? Because he knew that the gospel of Jesus Christ and his witness even trumped his, his rights as a Roman citizen. Because the gospel comes first in every aspect of living. Um, and I've seen this played out concretely in the lives of many, most concretely in the lives of Bryce and Shelley Richard. If you see how they talk and how they live their life and how they raise their children, everything was for sharing the gospel. Every aspect of their life was a conviction to, it is not me, Jesus, it's about you. And they entered school, they went to school, the kids went to school with that mission in mind. I, I've never seen it played out so fully in a family, and I, I was blessed by that. So what we see here is that Jesus lives out his own teaching, and I'm, uh, we refer to Luke 22, 47 through 53, to show how Jesus did not his, to claim his own innocence and his own rights, so that he might do his Father's will. So let's go ahead and just read briefly, Luke 22, 47 through 53, and then we'll go on into the meat of the lesson. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. 
But Jesus said, no more of this. Stop this. It's literally stop. Stop. Okay? No more of this. No more. And he touched the soldier's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? Notice he's confronting violence, not with violence or retaliation, but with the healing presence of his person. In the face of violence, he continues to bring healing to his captors. That's what it means to follow Christ. That's why he said pray for your enemies or go the extra mile, because the healing presence of Jesus is more important than the retaliation, and he demonstrates it. When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. See, Jesus even knew that even though he was now a victim of violence and oppression, a victim of Rome and Roman's torture machine, even then he knew that it wasn't about them. It was about this higher purpose of going to the cross. I want you to remember the two time, the few times that Jesus confronts Satan. One, the wilderness experience. What did Satan promise Jesus? I'll give you the power, keys of the kingdom. You can eat bread. Just tell the stones to turn to bread. It is the temptation is going the way of power without having to go through the cross, and that's the satanic threat. And then when Peter, you remember, when Jesus says, "Who does people say that I am?" Peter said, you are the Christ. And then Jesus said, yes, the Son of Man shall die and, and the third day be lifted up. And what did Peter say? Do you remember? Remember it says, Peter rebuked Jesus and said, it shall not be. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Do you remember? Get thee, me, Get thee behind me, Satan. Because you can't have this life, this Christ-following life, this discipleship without going through the cross. But there's a higher purpose. There is a spiritual war. There's... There's a spiritual battle going on that Jesus is waging that is not handled in the flesh or with the sword. So when you have this kind of ethic in which Jesus is living and embodying that kind of pro-life ethic of, of bringing healing and reconciliation and healing grace, even to the point where he forgives the people who tortured him, okay? Forgive them for they know not what they do. How does the church in all of their fragility and all of its weakness and all of its imperfection, how does the church live out that kind of ethic? We see that with an ax, and we see that throughout the New Testament of how the early church took Jesus' teaching and Jesus' example and put it into practice. And you know what happens when, when, when they did that? They changed the entire world. How do you think Christianity became the, the religion of Rome? In, in 300 years. It's because they lived and obeyed Jesus' words and through the power of the Holy Spirit shared the, shared the gospel with everyone, bringing transformation to a world that thrived on violence and power and oppression and exploitation. <clears throat> the sanctity of life ethic, this pro-life ethic, this thread that we have been following through the Bible almost to the point where we're beating the dead horse, is so vitally important to the Bible and so unique to Israel and to this Christ movement that it literally was one of the ingredients that changed the world. Okay, Whenever there is a failure for God's people to bear witness or to stand up against oppression or exploitation, it's because there's something missing in our unique voice that bears witness to the conviction that we believe all life is sacred. It's when we fail to acknowledge that all life is sacred that the church starts to break down and become something other than Christ's church. And we've seen that uh, in many cases, uh, in so many times, and, and I think the church is suffering for it. Um, and we can get into the particulars later so we can fight about politics if you take me out to eat. So, Tammy, you're paying, right? <laughs> All right, I'm just kidding. Sue's paying. Sue's paying. All right, sorry. So let's see some examples. Um, and what I want you to do is I want you to look at common themes in these pro-life texts, okay? <laughs> Acts 8, verses 1 through 8. You're going to see that we're called to be witnesses, not judges, defense attorneys, or prosecutors, and how important it is to bear witness even in the face of violence. Uh, Acts 8, 1 through 8. All right, you all there? Okay. <laughs> 
Let's see here. And Saul approved their, their killing him. This was uh, Stephen, okay? That day a severe persecution began against... Oh, this is after Stephen's death, by the way. That day, after Stephen's martyrdom, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the country of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. But those who were scattered went from place to place. What did they do? Did they plan their coup? Did they go place to place planning their, uh, their revenge? What were they doing? They were scattered, going from place to place doing what? Verse 4. Proclaiming. Proclaiming the word. Proclaiming the word. They didn't get lawyers. They didn't plot revenge. They didn't try to assassinate Paul, Saul. And imagine if they did plan their revenge and assassinate Paul, then what would have happened? You wouldn't have Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and the rest. Okay, so think of the worldview. Think of the mindset. Let's, let's finish off the verse 8 here. To verse 8. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud shrieks came out of many who were possessed, and many others who were paralyzed or lame were cured. So there was what? Great joy in the city. Can you imagine being a... I want you to go back to verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 1. Read chapter 8, verse 1. Is this just a bunch of people just getting kicked out of their homes? What is it? It's a severe persecution. And in the midst and face of severe persecution, they're proclaiming the word. And what's happening? Demons are getting exercised. There are healings. And rather, in the face of severe persecution, the thing that the Christians bring to the table is joy. Joy. Okay? Because we're the only ones who have joy. Okay? Now, you may see people who are not followers of Christ who are happy, but do they really have that joy? Put them in the midst of severe persecution. Christians should be the ones who are have that, that spark of joy that proclaim the word, even in the point of severe joy. Um, I'm reading a book about community, I see that hand, community trauma. Slaves who are on the holds of ships, bound together, what did they do? They sang. You sing Amazing Grace because of slaves. You know, we sing, uh, we're going to do uh, Swing Low Sweet Chariot Sunday because slaves in the face of persecution and trauma chose to sing because somehow I have a feeling that their faith was a lot stronger in the face of persecution than some of us who, who might be inconvenienced every now and then uh, are. All right, Mitzi. Um, I kind of pre-read this while I was waiting for everybody to come. And something that stuck out to me is the word witness. Yes. Witness. What does a witness do? They speak. That's right. And this, you're, all these verses that you're going to be reading tonight are about Christians talking yeah. and witnessing. Yeah. And that goes on and on. Because if you're a witness, if you're not going to say anything, so when we see something, whether it's encouraging or whether it's condemning, we need to speak well. Yep. Notice my little note there under the Acts 8 and Revelation 1. We are called to be witnesses, not what? Judges. Judges. What about defense attorneys? Some people are so busy trying to defend God that they end up turning people away from God. And a witness tells what they have seen, heard, or experienced. That's right. I cannot be a witness to what you did. I can only say what That's I right. did. These verses just kind of tell me I need to speak up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that applies to all of us. Yeah, and share the good news. And it should be good news. Yeah. Uh, and also not prosecutors. I know a lot of prosecuting Christians, prosecutors, some mean Christians out there who, who would, make, would make great prosecutors, but that doesn't make a hill of beans of a difference because they're, you know, because that's not good news. That's just their opinions. Uh, they're trying to prove a point. Witness. 
Uh, in Revelation, if you read the, the Revelation is one of the most pro-life books in the New Testament as a whole, because in Revelation, Christians are facing severe persecution, and John is writing from an exile place of being in Patmos. He's exiled, he's a refugee, um, he's displaced, he's homeless, and in the midst of that displacement, he receives a vision, and throughout Revelation, Jesus says, you will overcome by your testimony. All right, now we're not going to read it because we'll save a little time. But I want you to read the quote here from J.B. Lawrence, an old, old pastor. This means that the fighting which Christ does and which he authorizes his disciples to do is to be done by the lips and not by the hands. It is by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus that the world is to be evangelized. It is a nonviolent, notice aggressive, notice he puts these two words together. It's nonviolent, but it's aggressive. Notice that? I think this was kind of the key for Martin Luther King Jr., you know, it was nonviolent, but it was aggressive. He pushed when he needed to push. It is a nonviolent, aggressive campaign of truth and reason. We are to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The appeal is not to violence, but to conscience and to reason. So you can read Revelation later and, and read that. And that's throughout, throughout the book of Revelation. Um, and, uh, and in Revelation, the Lord says, you will overcome by your word. The testimony of your word. And it's Christ who does the, the judging and the fighting. Okay. Let's read Romans 12, uh, 14 through 13, 10. This is one of my favorite passages. Remember we did Romans uh, last summer. So we did a long, long study in Romans. It was really fun. So this is a little bit repetitive, but, you know, I can't remember what I ate for breakfast last week. So... <coughs> I don't want you to turn to Romans 12 yet. I want you to go to Romans 13, verse 1. All right? Romans 13, verse 1 says this. Let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Now, what the problem is, is you probably heard sermons on that, but that's not where this passage begins. Just because it's a new chapter... And it's verse 1. It doesn't mean that Paul is starting a new argument. You cannot divorce this part, portion of Scripture without the previous portion because I think the people who put the numbers in the Bible did a real disservice by splitting up Romans 12, 14 through, uh, with 13, 1. So you have to go back to Romans 12, verse 14, or actually verse 9 if you want to be technical, to really get this whole section. Okay, but we're going to go ahead, uh, let's go ahead and read verse 9. Okay, we'll, we'll jump back to verse 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Have you ever tried to outdo somebody in showing honor? Next time you, somebody cuts you off in the road when you're driving, <laughs> see if you can outdo them in showing honor. I'm telling you right now, I'm a failure at that. <laughs> okay, I'm not mean. I'm not one of those mean drivers. But, you know, I don't really think nice things when people cut me off. <laughs> but you're supposed to outdo one another in showing honor. And honor is a public word. It's not just you and your friends. Honor is a public, kind of a public value in this world. It's not a private kind of sharing. Um, do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in what? Suffering. Persevere in prayer. So if you're suffering, pray, right? Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to who? <coughs> Friends? Extend hospitality to strangers. Okay? This is verse 13. Romans 12, 13. All right, verse 14. Bless those who what? What about, are you sure that says that that's correct? Because last I heard, usually most people only bless those who, you know, bless them. You know, we bless people who vote like we vote, you know, who think like we think. No, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Well, does that apply to the people that cut you off? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yes. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. I like that one. Don't be too big for your britches. That's my interpretation. Do not repay anyone what? Evil for evil. But take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, Notice this, if it is possible, if it depends on you, live peaceably with one another. Now what happens if you can't live peaceably with one another because you've done everything you can? What do you do for the other person? Because you can only do what you can do. It says, as far as what you can do, what you have in your power to do, you live peaceably with one another. But what happens if the other person chooses not to live peaceably with you? Well, then you go back a few verses. Do not repay evil for evil. Bless those who persecute you. But you should try everything you can to be at peace with one another, okay? Verse 19 is connected to this. Beloved, never, sometimes, maybe, maybe a few times. Is it a few times, sometimes? No. What's the word? Never. Just when you feel like it, when it's convenient. Again, if they belong to a different political party. No, never, never, never. Never avenge yourselves. Now, what does your Bible say in the King James? Uh, verse 19. Beloved, never what? Avenge not yourselves, but rather displace unto wrath. Okay, but it says avenge not yourselves? Avenge, yes. Okay, let's just stay there. Avenge not yourselves. Is there any way that that is unclear? Okay. Is it God's word? Is it inspired? Is it infallible? Is, it, is, it, is there any gray in that? Okay? It says, my, my version says, never avenge yourself. Now, if that's the infallible inspired word of God, <laughs> that means one thing. Never avenge yourself. Okay? Now, now I'm building up to this. If your enemies are hungry, what? Feed them. Now, is the Lord, is the inspired infallible word of God giving you a choice on this? It's saying if you feel like it, no. When we talk about biblical fidelity as God's people, and we talk about the inspired, infallible Word of God, I'm sorry, but there are many people who think this is optional. Okay? I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of others. Now, I know what you're thinking, so don't worry. I'm going to get there. Okay? I just got to finish. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by doing this, you will heap burning coals in their heads. Do not be overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. All right, so now the $20 million question. If somebody shoots my father, okay, which really happened, am I supposed to give this person food to eat and drink and bless him and send him on his way? I can't avenge for my father's death. I can't repay evil for evil. The Lord did not give me that as a choice, okay? As far as I'm concerned, I am to live peaceably. So the question that Paul has to deal with here, this is why you can't divorce 13 from 12, the question is, well then, if this person takes the life of my family member, and I'm doing everything I can to live peaceably, and I'm going to provide for his welfare, okay, then how does that person, be? and I can't avenge my dad's death, because if I avenge my dad's death and kill him, guess who's going to kill me next? His son, who's like Mike's size, you know, Big Mike, Superman? Okay, so his son is probably going to come kill me if I kill his, his father who killed my father. Because that's how the world works. This is why we started in Genesis when the violence multiplied. And this is why Jesus says, stop it. And on the cross says, forgive them. He stops the cycle of violence. So if, my, if I can't avenge in any circumstance <coughs> the... the my father and this person and rob my grandchildren of having somebody to dance with at their wedding who's then what what happens Read the end of verse 19. No, no you don't even have to go that you go to chapter 13 verse 1 that's why you can't divorce 13 1 from the rest so the end of 19 says vengeance is mine oh yes vengeance you know i skipped that thank you that's right thank you so much i did skip it thank you yeah i did i overlooked it sorry um, I'm on a roll, that's why. All right, let's go to, so, so the question is, how do you, what do you do with this person, right? 
Chapter 13, verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those of its authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur what? Judgment. Okay, now we're talking about judgment. Okay? For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid. For the authority does not bear what? The sword. Okay, so now we're back to the sword. So if Peter can't bear the sword, slice off the ear, and I can't avenge my loved one's death, okay, then God has appointed who to do that? Who to be the judge, the governing authority. So God's governing authorities that God puts in place, that's who takes care of, that's, they're the ones who do the justice and, the, and execute justice and keep people accountable. So that is the role of government. That is the role of, of the authority. And I think that's important that that's in the Bible because if you're busy bearing witness, God has set up a system of accountability that continues to be pro-life. Okay, because God does establish the government to exact judgment.